We'll begin in one minute. Hello, everybody. This is Jim Cahill, and welcome to our maiden voyage of Millen's live process control seminar and demo series. We're calling these Deminars for short. Today's topic is PID control of sampled measurements. The broadcast is being recorded and will be available for future viewing, so please share with your friends if you find it of value. And we're going to be muting all but Greg's microphone, so please use the Q&A box to ask your questions of Greg, and I'll be monitoring them and verbally relay them through the course of the presentation. So we'd love to have it interactive. As you have a question, let us know. And I guess with that, I will turn it over to Greg. Thank you, Jim. I'm glad you all can join us. Uh, this seminar series is sponsored by Emerson, Xperia Tech, a local business partner in the Midwest, and Mina, uh, who uh, provides simulation software. It's created by me uh, at Emerson and Jack Ehlers at Monsanto. Well, this is me. I've written about a dozen serious books and about a half a dozen humorous ones. Nearly all of them are published by ISA. There's a couple back in print. Uh, this year by Momentum Press, uh, also do a control talk column in Control Team uh, uh, with Stan Wiener, and I've been doing that since uh, 2002, shortly after retiring from uh, Solution Monsanto. Uh, my expertise is available on my website, and I've been doing oh, about three blogs a month for uh, the last four years, so there's uh, quite a collection there. My most recent book uh, provides the latest on smart uh, and wireless instrumentation, and it was done uh, with Rosemont and Fisher Controls. Uh, so there's a lot of detailed information here, particularly on the, on the latest capability. Um, and I don't think you'll find this, um, say, in other books yet. The royalties are donated to the University of Texas campus for energy and environmental resources, and we're working with them to develop a wireless instrumentation and control applications, principally in CO2 capture for power plants, but also in the performance of distillation columns. Well, we may think process control is exciting, but um, if you ask uh, your neighbors and friends, and maybe your spouse, what they think, you might get a different opinion. So to help improve public perception and to attract new talent to a profession, I came up uh, with a top ten list of uh, ways to make process control more enticing. Number ten, travel programs focusing on process control systems of cruise ships. Boy, I, my recent cruise, I was really impressed when I got to see the control room for the captain. Um, the only thing I guess that was a little dis disconcerting was the fact that uh, there was nobody in the room, even though we were out at sea. Uh, must be pretty well uh, on automatic control. Uh, then, uh, how about number nine? Uh, Sci-fi flicks devoted to process control systems and starships. If you're a Star Trek fan, you can appreciate the significance there. Reality shows where teams compete to improve process control performance. There's so many reality shows. They're so popular, why not have one on process control systems? Seven, entourage shows where groupies use process control to keep their star from self-destruction. Well, that may not be possible for some stars. Support analysis programs where commentators and listeners talk about the dynamics and feed-forward control opportunities in football. could really get into that. 
Robot movies were advanced parallel processing robots, optimized plants. Boy, talk about uh, a 3D virtual type of movie. That, that could be really something else. Number four, detective shows where a special investigator with cute, compulsive, obsessive habits and an incredibly keen mind for details solves mysterious process control problems. So if you ever watched the Monk show, you can kind of imagine, hey, how about the uh, process control guy playing the, the Monk part? Who done it? Novels where the Monk culprit is a bad acting control valve. Well, you know, for maybe about 20 or 30 percent of the loops, uh, this has been the case. Uh, uh, if particularly you're into a situation where you weren't using control valves from say, uh, a company that's in the control valve business, like the throttling valve business like Fisher Controls. Number two, a web video with cute animal antics in the foreground and engineers talking about process control opportunities in the background. Boy, that could make a big difference. I'm not sure people would understand what's being talked about in the background, but it would sure, certainly give us a lot of recognition. And here's my favorite here because we have the opportunity to use the latest in smart and wireless instrumentation and the more powerful tools that are now available in the newer versions of the distributed control systems if we could get cash for clunker programs to replace the inefficient old distributed control systems, transmitters, and valves. This demo and seminar series is based on a self-learning web lab. And we're thinking that the best way to, to learn Prossel is more by a hands-on interactive activity. And so the whole goal of this thing is to provide uh, by web access interactive labs and uh, do this first of all for generic process control loops. And for today, for today we're just going to look at a single loop. Uh, but then go on to cascade control, feed forward control, and into the control of unit operations, both on a continuous and a batch operation. And uh, we're going to start uh, making these labs generally available uh, anytime, anywhere, over the Internet, uh, starting in May. So let's uh, take a look at the single loop lab. We're going to show access uh, to the operate run user interface. Uh, we're going to show access to the PID faceplate in detail, the process history view trend chart. And then we're going to make some set point changes to show the existing process response. And while that's happening, we're going to show access to valve process and measurement parameters for sensitivity, noise, and dynamics. When you come into the lab, what you'll probably see is a main graphic display, which right now shows uh, five labs, and the first three are the generic type uh, process control labs, so looking at single loop, cascade loop feed floor loops. And then we get into the unit operations labs for uh, temperature and pH. So today we're going to focus on uh, the single loop lab. And if we click on that, yeah. uh, we see a block diagram. Okay. I think I'm in on the wrong one. The block diagram it shows uh, the primary PID controller, the fact we have a control valve. And then the process is split into two parts. The uh, first part is a secondary process, and maybe you can look at that as just being uh, flow being generated. Uh, and then there's a primary process, which is uh, one typically of much more interest, uh, like the temperature or the level, the composition, or the pH. And for the single loop uh, situation, we have a primary measurement that then goes back to supply a process variable to the PID controller. Since we have broken the process into two parts, so we can look at secondary disturbances and primary disturbances. And while these are kind of shown going into the middle of the block, actually they go into the input of the block. So the secondary disturbance enters into the secondary process at the same point as uh, the manipulated flow does. Um, and so we have basically for them the same dynamics for those. Uh, coming out of the secondary process, we go into a primary process, and the primary process is still entered in at the same point uh, that the secondary process does. The same effects 
as the secondary process uh, does in terms of uh, affecting the primary event. So we would like to interface the PID controller here, and there is a faceplate uh, that you can see here an icon for it. And if you click on that, uh, that brings up uh, the, uh, what is a, typically a familiar faceplate on most uh, DCS systems, and you have uh, the process controller output, you have the process controller PV in yellow, and you have the set point. If you go down to the bottom here, to the far left uh, icon, it uh, enables you to get the details on this PID. And if you click on that, uh, up comes uh, a detail display that gives you the, a lot of the limit settings that are in there. Uh, in terms of um, anti-reset wind-up outputs and set points. Uh, it gives you the tuning settings and the filters and uh, the rate limiting of the set point uh, up and down. And has an interesting feature we'll be getting into next for the IDEB band. And there's also a feed for it game. Uh, if you click on any of these blocks here in, in this diagram, and we'll, we'll just click on the secondary process block, uh, what will come up is uh, uh, a bunch of parameters uh, that provide incredible flexibility for you looking at different scenarios. So under the PID tab, uh, right away we can see, we can set a filter here as well. Uh, we, uh, more interesting is the fact that here we can choose one of eight structures for the PID, and not much has really been in, uh, said in the literature, relative value of these uh, structures for different objectives and different types of process dynamics and applications. So here we have eight structures uh, to try. Uh, we also have the ability to use a dynamic reset uh, limit type feature and an I dead band, uh, which we'll get into next week, and then a an PID enhancement, which is the main subject here. For the process, uh, we have the opportunity to look at uh, different types of processes, self-regulating, integrating, runaway. And we can do that for both uh, the primary and the secondary. We have for the measurement, uh, we can choose sample times, uh, sensitivity, and both of these could be related to analyzers or to wireless measurements. We have a, uh, a lag, a bias, and a noise parameter. For disturbances, we can set the size, the lag, and the period of the disturbances. For the control valve, we have the ability to enter the actual uh, characteristic in terms of a table of that. Instead of like saying uh, that it fits a theoretical uh, characteristic, like equal percentage, you can take uh, the values from a sizing catalog in terms of percent of max C sub V and enter them as a percent uh, max flow here. And so you get a much more detailed and um, much more specific uh, match to your particular control valve of interest. And then on the right side, we have the ability to change uh, a lot of interesting things about uh, control valve dynamics. If you go to another icon here, to the right of the faceplate, and you click on that, uh, you come up with a process history view. And uh, if that uh, doesn't pop up for you when you go into the lab, you can go to the open folder and select it here. And, uh, and then you'll get it. Uh, let's go back and uh, see if we can create something interesting, because right now it's just drawing a straight line. Nothing's happening. So let's go here to the faceplate. And uh, for the set point, let's click on it. And we'll enter a new value, say 60%. And uh, we'll go to the process history view. And we'll see the fact that we've made a set point change. Uh, since this is a relatively fast process, uh, and necessarily so, so that we can uh, show in a demo time frame here of, of about an hour uh, some interesting things, um, it's quite fast. And so what we should do up here is to decrease the time span so that we can take a better look at what's going on. And uh, probably about uh, two clicks on that will be helpful, but then we need to scroll forward since it uh, went off scale and get that back. Uh, and if you want to accentuate the color for one of these items, like for the PV, uh, you can click on that. And uh, I also have uh, the Zoom It uh, type feature uh, that allows me to uh, zoom in uh, on the response. 
And we can see that uh, in the dark blue here uh, that uh, there's maybe a very tiny overshoot, but not much. Uh, the overshoot we do see is primarily in the controller output, uh, the cyan. Um, but what's really important is uh, the dark blue process variable, and it's uh, essentially lined out already. So let's go back to our presentation and uh, see what else we can learn about this application. This brings us to a question. What will dramatically improve the performance of loops using atline analyzers, making tuning easier, and virtually eliminating oscillations? What can increase control valve packing life by a factor of 10? What can make battery life of wireless measurements a non-issue? What will eliminate the limit cycle for measurement sensitivity limits? What will smoothly handle a loss in I.O. communication? Well, the answer in these cases is an enhanced PID. And that will be the topic that we're going to primarily focus on today. So let's go back to our lab and uh, look at the response for the traditional PID case. And, and let's create a measurement sample time delay that's significant. That's uh, 20 seconds. And to make sure that the sample time is dominating the effect, uh, we're going to set the sensitivity out of range, say 100%, so that it's really relying upon the sample time for updates. Then we're going to make set point changes to show the traditional PID response to this large sample time that is actually twice the process time constant. And for our demo today, it's a self-regulating process. So you see we have uh, quite a nice response here. Uh, but let's see how we can kind of mess that up by uh, creating some sample time delays. So if we go to the measurement tab and we put the sensitivity out of range, in other words, we're going to say that it would take 100% change for it to trigger an update. So it's really not working on uh, any sort of recognition of what's changing. And we're going to then depend upon uh, a sample time. In this case, it's 20 seconds. Now, that doesn't seem like much, but you got to remember that's uh, twice the process time constant of 10 seconds. And you can say, well, you know, I wouldn't have an analyzer in such a fast loop. Well, you could view these as not being seconds, but minutes. And so this would be a process with a 10-minute uh, time constant and then an analyzer with effectively a 20-minute sample time. Let's see how the starts. Let's make a set point change. And go back to process history view. And we'll let that develop. So let's go back uh, to the presentation. And this is the heart of what we're going to talk about. First of all, let's uh, consider the traditional PID controller, which is the upper block diagram we've got shown here. Furthermore, let's consider one where the integral action consists of a filter. There's a lot of advantage to DCSs, and there are several manufacturers who do this, who implement the integral action by means of a filter. And the input of the filter is the output of the controller. And that then is added in 
to the contribution from the proportional mode. So this case of B is really the, the gain associated with the proportional mode. And since it's added in, it's called positive feedback. The reset time is simply the filter time setting here. And you get the ramping action from this that you would from an interval mode. And if you work through the equations, uh, it'll come out uh, looking like an integrator. And it acts like an integrator. It has the advantages, though, that it enables this dynamic reset limiting that we'll find in a future lab is very useful for slow control valves or for secondary loops. It also helps make a very smooth transition and override control. And uh, we'll see here that it is the principal advantage and enables us to do this enhancement uh, that we sh will show is uh, so useful for sample measurements. So we look at the enhanced PID controller. And one of the main things uh, to, to look at is that there is a communication stack recognition of the fact that uh, there is a new value arriving. And so a new value flag is set. That then goes to the integral calculation in terms of a filter. And it also goes to the derivative mode calculation. And this case of D here is uh, the derivative mode's uh, gain, which is uh, typically a combination then of the controller gain and, and rate uh, time. And uh, as a result now, this controller is only going to make a calculation when of the integral in, in derivative modes only when it gets a new value. With the traditional PID, even though it doesn't have any new information uh, and doesn't know really what's going on if anything has really changed, uh, it continues to ramp the integral mode. Also, when it does get an update, the derivative mode said, well, that whole update since the last community occurred in this module execution time. And since our modules execute maybe could be once per second, it says that whole change occurred in one second. And as a result, you get a spike from the derivative mode. Similarly, if you were to lose communications of the process variable for a period of time, and this could happen for, say, field bus or for wireless instrumentation. When it is reestablished, uh, the derivative mode is going to say, wow, all of this happened in one second. Furthermore, the integral mode during the loss of communication is going to ramping off in what might be even the wrong direction. So there is a, a considerable advantage uh, for loss of condition and also for recognizing that if you don't have new information, you shouldn't be doing anything with the integral and derivative modes. And furthermore, you should spread them over the communication interval, the time between, the elapsed time between the last update and the current update. As a result, you get uh, some significant features that uh, is actually surprising in terms of, of the benefits uh, in, in, in control of performance. So to summarize here, the integral mode is restructured to provide integral action. And if, if we use uh, the concept of setting the reset time equal to the process time constant, we are in uh, essence then matching the response time in, in that elapsed time. And so it does the filter calculation, but it does it only when there is an update and if we're using uh, uh, an interval time or reset time as equal to the process time constant. In a way, the controller is recognizing uh, and taking into account what it would have been the process response. But it's not essential that the reset time be set equal to the process time constant. And what we'll see is that the enhanced PID controller does compensate for this uh, or recognizes this uh, sample time. Uh, and doesn't do anything until it gets an update, uh, that we'll see that is actually uh, quite insensitive uh, to the reset time setting. 
and is, uh, provides a robustness, a smoothness of control, even if you don't have the right tuning settings. The derivative mode is modified to compute a rate of change over the elapsed time from the last new measurement value. So the PID reset and rate action are only computed when there's a new value. If we also set the transmitter dampening, filtering, to make the noise amplitude less than the sensitivity limit that triggers saying there is a new value, then we can dramatically improve valve packing and battery life. And this is because we're not making updates, changing the error that is then used as a, in, in terms of changing the controller output. And so we're not making the controller output respond to the noise, and therefore we're reducing the number of times the valve strokes, and we're also reducing the number of communications by a wireless transmitter, which uh, significantly improves uh, the life of the packing and the battery. So the enhancement compensates for measurement sample time, and by doing that, it's, we'll see it suppresses oscillations and enab enables a smooth recovery from a, uh, and, and also from a loss in communication, and further extending uh, the packing and battery life. And so uh, if you also take into account um, what we're going to see at the end of this demo, that the fact that it kills a limit cycle, uh, uh, created by a measurement sensitivity setting that's too large, uh, we see that we can uh, make a significant difference in unnecessary fluctuations in the controller output. In terms of uh, the importance for wireless control, you can go to the website here, and, uh, and you can just search on wireless, uh, or you can go to this uh, specific uh, PDF and look at more details. Well, let's go back to the lab and look at the response of a traditional PID for a large sample time. And then we're going to cut the reset in half. In other words, we're going to double the amount of reset action. We're going to make a set point change again to show the traditional PID response to this large sample time, which is twice the process time constant for regulating process, but with a halved reset time. So you notice the response here uh, was uh, not anywhere near as good as it was with the measurement of no delay, sample uh, time. And while it's not strictly a time delay, uh, you kind of have two choices here. And you say, well, it's not really part of a, a time lag. And so we kind of associate it with a time delay, even though, strictly speaking, it is not one. So let's kind of zoom in here, and uh, we see that uh, uh, now we have an oscillation. It is decaying, um, but uh, it is significant. It's causing process variability, uh, and it's caused by the fact uh, with a traditional PID, even though there isn't a uh, change or an update in information uh, in terms of what's going on in the process, the uh, the controller output is ramping through its integral action here, and as a result, it goes way beyond where it should be. That causes uh, an undershoot of the process variable, and uh, then the continuing action here of the, uh, the traditional PID in terms of integral action ramping on you, and, and it goes too far in the other direction, and so you get a little bit of overshoot, and eventually it dies out. See what happens if we don't have a controller tuned uh, so precisely, and uh, instead, uh, and that's uh, you know I'm not saying that um, you know people are making mistakes just uh, due to nonlinearities or some conditions that have changed, and as a result, the reset time setting is uh, not too fast. But we'll create this by having uh, the reset time, and then. Uh, to see what happens as a result of that, let's make another set point change. And go to uh, the process history view. I 
know you're all in suspense as what's going to happen, but you can immediately see, boy, it's going to be worse because look how far uh, the controller output now has uh, overshot the set point and it's continuing to ramp up. Uh, so this is going to be uh, pretty nasty. But uh, let's keep you in a little suspense of what's really going to happen and we'll go uh, to the seminar. So this is the self-learning lab screen we've been working with, and I haven't talked about the fact that we have online uh, loop metrics, and here for the generic loops, uh, we're focusing on peak errors and uh, integrated absolute errors. Peak errors are important to, to prevent uh, the actuation of uh, safety instrumentated systems, um, or for blowing relief valves or rupture discs or for RICRA violations, uh, or environmental violations uh, uh, for pH. And in some cases, it could be for conductivity. Uh, so, there, you know, there are cases where you have to make sure that the maximum deviation from set point is not going to cause, say, some premature uh, of uh, or fatiguing of the rupture disc, for example. You don't even have to get to the setting, but if you get close to the setting and do that repeatedly, uh, you can cause premature uh, relief and, and rupture. And so uh, peak error can be uh, very important for on-stream time and also to uh, make sure that there are no environmental consequences. Um, you don't want your safety instrumentated system to have to do something, and so uh, it's much safer if the ba basic control system does its job uh, and prevents that from being necessary. And so we also have an integrated error, which is more related to the amount of, say, product that's uh, off spec if you're looking at integration of the process variable. If you do an integrated uh, uh, error for the uh, controller output, and particularly uh, in terms of some split range doubt, let's say for coolant, uh, you could come up with maybe the amount of uh, energy associated. Uh, with dealing with disturbances. Anyway, you got uh, a lot of things uh, that can be uh, recognized from uh, the peak and integrated errors, and you can go to my website in the March 10th through April 2nd entries on uh, integrated peak errors. There's a four-part series there, and it gets into the uh, sources of these errors, uh, what affects them, whether it's tuning or dynamic, uh, what's the importance uh, in, in terms of these errors, how uh, they affect on-stream time, yield, capacity, and uh, environmental uh, compliance. And, and then finally, it concludes uh, with a checklist uh, that's useful whether you're trying to minimize these errors or just do a better job with your control system. And so the very last entry on a, uh, April 2nd uh, does get into this checklist, and there's actually 10 entries in it. And it's done kind of in the order of uh, things to check uh, and in the order of priorities. So right off the bat, uh, you know, we're saying, hey, let's, uh, let's use the best uh, measurement technology because you can only – do as good as what your measurement is telling you about the process. Uh, let's make sure we pick the sensor location and installation method to provide the most representative measurement in the process without stagnation. But the best velocity, fastest response, least noise. It gets into uh, some more of the details associated with that uh, in uh, sub uh, sub-entries there. And then now uh, we get into the fact we should use real throttle valves for smart positioners and not get fooled into using uh, uh, valves from, say, piping manufacturers uh, who were primarily in the business of supplying on-off valves or isolation valves. And by throwing on a positioner, they think uh, they've given you a throttle valve. So you want to go to a real control valve manuf manufacturer who was in business uh, from the beginning for throttling applications. So let's go back uh, to the lab now and see how the traditional PID is doing. And then we'll switch it to the enhanced PID and see if we can uh, do better. Wow. Well, you can see we got a big problem here. And uh, 
And it looked like for a while the oscillations were growing, but I think what happened, it hit the high limit there. And, um, and they may be decaying, but they're pretty darn severe. So let's see about that. Uh, let's go to the PID tab. And let's uh, bring in the enhancement. So we're going to enable PID plus. And it's going to automatically turn on dynamic reset limiting, which is a key feature that it uses to, for it to do its job. And I can see what happens uh, here in terms of the oscillation. But uh, while that's uh, developing, we'll go back to the seminar because it was so severely upset, it's going to take a while to uh, quiet down. <clears throat> well, let's, uh, let's take a look at some tests I've done. And here it's for an integrating process. Now, the enhancement uh, was really designed with a self-regulating process in mind. And by far, that's the largest number of applications. But there are some very important, interesting integrating process applications. So we wanted to see how they enhance PID for that. Uh, in these studies, the upper row of trend charts is always for the standard or traditional PID. And the middle trend chart is for, uh, say, a base case of tuning or maximum load rejection. And uh, whether you think this is good tuning or not is not the issue. For the set point response, it, it does show the fact that there is some overshoot. But, and so it's fairly aggressive uh, tuning. Uh, what we see here as a result of uh, cutting the reset time in half is that we break out into some pretty severe oscillations, uh, but they are decaying. Now, if we were to double the reset time, uh, we see that detuning the controller helps uh, somewhat here. Let's go to the bottom row of trend charts. And here we're looking at the enhanced PID and the base case for aggressive tuning. We see that it actually does a little bit of a better job, I think, than the traditional PID. But it's really quite noticeable in terms of the improvement. Uh, if we uh, were to uh, only, uh, cut the reset time in half, or if the dynamics essentially changed so that we uh, had a reset time that was uh, too much, uh, or too much reset action, a reset time that was too small. And we see here that uh, we, we do have some oscillations, um, but the oscillations with the enhanced uh, PID decay uh, very rapidly. And the performance, though, if we detuning the controller is about the same. And that's going to be a subject of the tuning uh, seminars later on this summer in terms of how the detuning masks some problems. You may think you're doing the right thing, but it turns out if you look at uh, what the integrated and peak errors are, they are directly related to the tuning of the controller. So if you want to get good scores on the lab, the solution is not to detune the controller, even though it might look prettier on the trend charts. Here we're going to look at the effect of gain changes. So again, the uh, top row is uh, the traditional or standard PID. Uh, or again, we're looking at integrating processes. And uh, now we're looking at uh, gain changes uh, for the middle trend chart. We've got the base case. And uh, in the denominator here, we have a lambda factor. And the gain factor, if we're, if for this case, where the dead time is, the original process dead time was rather negligible. You could say the gain factor is uh, 1 over that lambda factor. In this case, uh, the gain factor is 1 over 2.0, the 2.0 being the lambda factor. And if you're not into lambda tuning, that's OK, because that's not necessary. I understand the point here. Then if we uh, look at uh, the situation where we have uh, slightly increased the gain, we're only talking about a 17% increase, we notice that we've got much more severe oscillations. But they do die out. And now, if we uh, decrease the controller gain, and we're talking maybe about a 10% decrease in controller gain, we see that uh, there's less of a tendency to oscillate. If we look at what the enhanced uh, PID is doing, uh, we see that it gives about the same performance uh, in terms of oscillations for the base case. 
But when we get into uh, the uh, situation where we've just made a 17% increase in controller gain, we now see that we're able to suppress the oscillations. And for detuning, uh, you know, it doesn't show it doesn't show the advantage. Uh, and not to say it's not there. So let's uh, take a look and see what happened in terms of uh, the enhanced uh, PID. Uh, see if it could uh, decay those oscillations, and then we'll make set point changes to show what it does uh, for the situation where we have the reset time halved. Well, it really uh, caused a significant and fairly uh, rapid decay of those oscillations. So you can see uh, right away uh, the stability that it's added to the process control loop. And again, this translates the fact that you're going to have a longer valve packing life and uh, longer battery life. Um, besides uh, less process variability. And uh, particularly you have to remember that packing life is just not the number of moves, but may be related to the amount that the control valve moves. There is a travel accumulator, for example, in smart positioners, and the packing life may be uh, more a function of that uh, travel accumulator uh, diagnostic than the number of times that it has moved. So here, obviously, the travel accumulator would say we're doing uh, a much better job by using the enhanced PID. But let's see how it responds to set point change. And while that's happening, let's go back to the seminar. And let's look at uh, the cases for which this enhanced PID were really designed for, and that's for self-regulating processes. So again, in the top row, we're looking at trend charts for standard or traditional PID. The middle trend chart is for the base case for fairly aggressive tuning for maximum load rejection. And uh, we see that if we were to cut the reset time in half, double the reset action, we get into some pretty severe oscillations. Uh, if we were to detune the controller, reduce its performance, uh, we do have a smoother looking chart. Um, if we look at the um, bottom row here, uh, from the enhanced PID, we see right off the bat uh, for the uh, middle chart base case, we don't have any overshoot. Uh, and if we get into the case where it's not tuned correctly and we have uh, too much reset action, uh, we still don't have any oscillations. It's very good at suppressing these oscillations. In fact, the response looks uh, very much the same uh, regardless of uh, the reset time setting. Let's look at what would be happening for a, a change in controller gain. So again, top row, standard, traditional, PID. Uh, the gain factor in the beginning is uh, 1 over 2.0. 2.0 is the lambda factor. It's a negligible dead time process, so we can approximate the gain factor this way. And uh, we see for the base case, uh, it doesn't uh, look too bad. But uh, we get into oscillations and we make just a 17% increase in gain. And if we uh, reduce the gain by 10%, um, uh, we uh, suppress oscillations. Uh, if we go to the enhanced PID, uh, we see that uh, we have a smooth response uh, for the base case and then for the case of uh, too much reset action. And, of course, it does well if uh, its controller has been detuned. So let's uh, look at the separate point response of the enhanced PID with the half reset time for the large sample time. Uh, after we look at that response, then we're going to set the measurement sample time to be out of range, say, a uh, big number, 100,000 seconds. And we're going to set the sensitivity to a large value. 
So now, uh, with the sample time out of range, we're really going to be triggering updates off of the sensitivity setting, which we're going to put at 2%. We're going to change back to the traditional PID and make a set point change to see uh, how the traditional PID uh, responds to this poor uh, measurement sensitivity. Well, I can see it did a pretty darn good job on that set point response. Uh, so let's go back uh, and create a different scenario. We'll go to the measurements tab and uh, we'll say uh, now we've got a sensitivity setting in range and we're not going to get an update unless the change is greater than 2%. And we're going to put Sample time out of range so that it doesn't come into play and re relying upon really the sensitivity setting. Then we're going to make a set point change to trigger something interesting. And while that's developing, we'll go back to the seminar. I think a virtual plan is a great learning tool. I've been using it for about 10 years now, and boy, I, I uh, can't really imagine a, a career without it. Uh, and uh, I guess, you know, looking back at my days at Monsanto and Solution, uh, we learned a lot by process simulation because you can't try things out on the plant unless you're really solid and what you know what's going to happen. And so before you get to actually experimenting with a plant, you've got to have pretty much well known and all the scenarios addressed. And, and that may be the reason why some people don't make process control improvements. Uh, here with a virtual plant, you can do this ne necessary work up front uh, so that when you actually do some experimentation or verification of the improvement in the plant, uh, you know a lot of the possibilities and have addressed uh, a lot of the potential concerns that might exist. So uh, there's also a lot of other reasons why I use a virtual plant. And so here's the top 10. Uh, number 10, you can't freeze, restore, replay an actual plant batch. No separate programs to learn, install, interface, or support like we used to have to do in the 1980s and 1990s. No waiting on lab analysis. No raw materials. No environmental waste. And this one I like particularly, virtual instead of actual problems. Batches are done in 14 minutes instead of 14 days. The plant can be operated on a tropical beach. Uh, I did make the cover of Chemical uh, Engineering Magazine showing me using a virtual plant uh, with a tropical drink and uh, a lounge chair. And, you know, boy, uh, it is the life. Number two, uh, last time I checked my wallet, I didn't have $100 million for an actual plant, even if they would uh, give me one to experiment with. And number one reason, uh, the actual plant in my suitcase. If I'm going to go someplace and show people what's going on or to help them learn uh, how to make process control improvements, um, a virtual plant uh, can fit in your suitcase. There's a synergy with a virtual plant, and it's a result of the fact that uh, we're, uh, we're actually using uh, the uh, configuration, uh, operator graphics, and uh, an historian that's in the DCS. It's not an emulation, and this is where people get fooled. If you, if you go with an emulation, you're not sure you really have all of the sophisticated features. When you look at what the investment was put into a DCS in terms of a capability, just, in, just with a PID, if you look at all the options and, and parameters that you could take advantage of in a PID, it's just incredible. And so those uh, simulators, while they're kind of useful as a preliminary learning tool, really don't give you a chance to try out more, more of the sophisticated and powerful capabilities that are built into a DCS, uh, just in the PID controller as what we're going to be demonstrating uh, this spring and summer 
uh, and, and we, we could probably go on for the rest of the year and still have a lot more of the things uh, that are in an industrial PID that are really interesting that you wouldn't really get to in the simulator. And, and you've got to realize that these industrial PID algorithms are proprietary. And so um, the simplifications that might exist in simulators really don't do justice to the fact that uh, there's some uh, pretty heavy investment, engineering investment, to create something better in the DCS. Uh, what we have in the DCS is process analysis uh, tools, and we uh, part of the central part of the virtual plant is a dynamic process model. Uh, there are statistical tools that are being added, uh, so we'll have online data analytics. Already in uh, the DCS, uh, are connected to the DCS is a loop monitoring and tuning tool. It could be an auto tuner. It could also be an adaptive controller, and we're going to get into the use of that as we start tuning controllers for self-regulating, integrating, and runaway processes this summer. Uh, there's also model predictive controllers uh, and neural networks so, and fuzzy logic controllers that uh, are built into some of the DCSs. Really, the, the definition of, of doing something um, better in process control is, by, is, is really incorporating process knowledge. And, and so if we get that into the control system, uh, we can do something better in terms of making that process either have uh, a better yield or a better production rate, um, a better efficiency, and in general, just a better performance. And so it's really kind of a two-way street here. And the virtual plant becomes a warehouse of the process knowledge that most importantly can be shared because everybody uh, in the plant and supporting the plant and in engineering centers, the, the common uh, tool that they use are, and are familiar with, whether it's in the control room or in the configuration room, is the DCS. And so if that knowledge goes into the DCS environment, then you have a way of sharing that and communicating that. And so this is kind of a two-way street where uh, you increase your process knowledge and, uh, and then increases in process knowledge uh, also go into the virtual plant. Well, for me, uh, I use the virtual plant uh, just not for training, uh, but we eventually think of it for uh, training operators. But uh, I do it very early on for exploring opportunities and process control. And I usually, as a result, discover something I hadn't even realized. Uh, and then I prototype it and uh, work out the details and take care of the scenarios, uh, the gotchas. Uh, that are very important for it to be successful from day one. And uh, you end up deploying it, and you can use the deployed uh, configuration for training in the actual DCS system, or more likely you'd use the virtual plant uh, for training. It provides a consistent platform to maximize the flow of knowledge gained at each step in the commercialization process. Uh, from benchtop to pilot plant to industrial plant. And this is particularly true for the biopharmaceutical industry, where what is going to be in the industrial plant is set very early on by the biochemists on the benchtop, and, and to a lesser extent than in the pilot plant. And so we actually have Delta V systems at the benchtop level. Uh, that are providing this advanced capability that the biochemist then builds into the commercialization of the process. Because once that process is defined in the benchtop and pilot plant, it is essentially then um, designed per what was uh, developed, and there's very little opportunity uh, for making changes, particularly the further uh, as you get into the actual commercialization. So the farther upstream you can go in the commercialization process, the better off you are. And we did this uh, as well at Monsanto, which is part of our culture to do some simulation even in research and development. So let's look at the response of a traditional PID with a have reset time for the poor measurement sensitivity. And then we're going to change to the enhanced PID and make a set point change uh, to, to see if uh, 
uh, what it can do uh, in terms of, uh, of, of eliminating any potential problems with sensitivity. Well, there's a little bit of a limit cycle here, and uh, it isn't quite uh, what we uh, imagined, uh, maybe because of uh, the fact <laughs> that I made a mistake and that I left on the enhanced uh, PID. So uh, we got a little bit of a, a change here in the scenario. We have the advanced PID, uh, enhanced uh, PID enabled, and as a result, uh, there isn't a limit cycle. It may be a little bit, uh, but not much. So uh, let's go and uh, change it to the traditional PID. And we'll make another set point change. And we'll see how the traditional PID does with this. Uh, uh, sensitivity limit. While that's happening, let's go back to the seminar. If you look at the demographic time bomb, you can see the increasing importance of the virtual plant as a, not only a training tool, but for me, I think it's a learning tool. The average age of the process worker is uh, over 50 years. And I think while a lot of these statistics were primarily from, say, the energy industry, I think they're generally applicable in the process industry. Half of the current workforce will retire. That's more than 500,000 workers in five to 10 years. There's an irreplaceable loss of knowledge. Uh, the newer generation of workers uh, have a less of a mechanical inclination and exposure. And the scenario for control engineers and technicians may be even more severe due to the suspension of hiring in the 1980s. Um, if you look at a lot of plants and engineering departments, there seems to be an age gap. There may be some employees in their 20s, but then you can, there's very few in their late 30s or 40s. Most of them are and then uh, are in their late 50s or 60s. And so process plants are in danger of closing to the lack of qualified personnel. And the delayed retirement plans may be accelerated as re equity markets recover. Let's take a closer look at the essentials of a virtual plant. Again, reiterating, we are doing no emulation of the DCS. We are taking and exporting uh, the actual configuration and copying the operator graphic files and we're using the historian uh, in a uh, desktop or, uh, or laptop computer. And then for the instrumentation and control valves and for the process, uh, we're using a simulation and in this case a mimic uh, from MINA. And that's uh, providing the rest of the, of the plant. Uh, we end up with a complete virtual plant that has all of the automation system and significant features and response of the process. The simulation is developed in a studio that's similar to the control studio for configuration of the control system, except the blocks are not associated with control functions, but are some associated parts of the process. And the wires are now pipes or streams carrying a process fluid from one block uh, or process information from one block. Since you're using the actual operator graphics, uh, it, it provides a, a very common usable interface uh, for uh, all of the uh, people who are associated with the production unit, whether they're in an engineering department or even in a research department. And uh, since this is the interface they're going to have to use in the control room, it's, uh, it's something they either are familiar with or should be familiar with. And then the simulation software uh, allows you to run slower or faster than re 
real time uh, to uh, freeze, uh, restore, and replay uh, particular scenarios of interest. So let's go back to the lab. And in this case, uh, we're going to see how a traditional PID did uh, with that uh, sensitivity setting. OK. Well, what you can see right off the bat, uh, there is a, an overshoot. And then there's some oscillation. Now, it looks like it's decaying. Um, but uh, we'll come back to this uh, at the very end. We'll see that, that this station does not decay. And what we end up with is a square wave in the process variable uh, of uh, about uh, 2%. And uh, we have a ramp in the controller output. This is very similar to the square wave and limit cycle we would get from stiction in the control valve. But in this case, it's uh, due to the sensitivity limit in uh, the measurement that is not handled properly by the traditional PID. So again, we're looking at the performance here uh, of a traditional PID versus the smooth uh, and response that eliminated uh, this, uh, this limit cycle with the enhanced. And again, this translates to longer battery life and uh, longer stem packing life. I was a little surprised when I looked at some of the details of packing specifications that um, actually you could be wearing out packing in uh, less than a year in some applications. So we'll go back to the seminar. And we may not have time to come back to this, but uh, uh, it's going to continue here uh, doing kind of a square wave with a little bit of a few notches possibly. Uh, but it just, just continues on indefinitely. Hey, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Cahill. And before we open up the floor to uh, questions that you have for Greg, uh, we'd really like it if you'd take about a minute to go to this URL, would you recommend dot us slash 105679S21 and fill in this it's basically what you thought of it and then any feedback that you have that we can um, incorporate into future ones. Uh, secondly, I wanted to have everyone mark their calendars April 21st, same time, 1 o'clock Central Daylight Time, where Greg will do PID control of valve stiction and backlash. And also, today's seminar, Deminar as we call it, will be posted on both Emerson Process Experts and the modelingandcontrol.com blog. So if any of your friends or coworkers missed it, you can point them to the blog, and it should be up sometime later this week. And with that, I'd like to open it up and see if we have any questions for Greg. You can either unmute your mic, or we will um, read your questions as they come in. Okay, we'll give it about another 30 seconds or so in case you're typing right now and uh, see what happens. All right, I really appreciate everyone's time today and we look forward to seeing you on the 21st. Thanks a lot.